you guys used an emulator? Yeah. Everyone? Maybe I should have asked who hasn't. Hey. Cool. <laughs> well, I want to explain the basic idea behind an emulator because it's foundational to what I'm actually about to do. And what I'm about to do is weird. So, <laughs> um, what you have to know about the Nintendo is that it's just a computer like any other. And as a computer like any other, it has a processor, it has RAM, it executes instructions, it loads programs into its memory. The actual Nintendo had pretty paltry specs by today's standards. It had like a little under two megahertz um, in its processor. It was a, like a 6502 processor. It had two kilobytes of RAM in its main board. It had some video RAM, it had some other things, but a lot of the RAM could be sideloaded in through like a cartridge. And um, I'm actually going to leave this slide up for the rest of the day. <laughs> Um, so, as a computer that can load instructions, it is um, possible to look at these instructions and execute them not with hardware but with software. That's what emulation entails and does. So the real challenge there is actually to get a cartridge like this. I brought in my cartridge so we, you can make sure I wasn't pirating the game. <laughs> <laughs> It being open source bridge, that really matters. Um, what they did was they created a device that like creates the zero for the zero insertion for socket that comes into Nintendo, and it um, loads its entire address space in the memory and just records what numbers come back. So um, after all that is accomplished, the entire game exists as a small file of memory, and it's actually a really small file. I noted that my Super Mario Brothers ROM, and the ROM is the file we call the dump of memory, was actually only 40 kilobytes. Like, probably the words that I will say here today are more than 40 kilobytes worth, if they were, if they were typed out. This talk is actually based on a blog post that I wrote last year, um, which is actually already online on my website. Um, should have put my website on the slide, but it's emily.st, and you can search for it if you want. Um, it goes through this whole thing, it's a couple thousand words, and if you want to review any of the material I have here today, it is in that gizmo. So the goal of emulation is to actually create what the hardware does. So we have the numerical instructions, they look kind of like these gizmos up here in the upper left corner. And those gizmos uh, actually stand for actual instructions that can be understood by the hardware. So it's perfectly possible to write a program that loads the instructions and executes them and figures out, like it, it represents like what pictures loaded on the screen at the time, what sound to make. It's not too difficult. Nintendo had special hardware for sound and video, as you can imagine, just like they do today. But it was a little weirder. <laughs> um, the upshot of all this is that I can take a file, put it on the computer and play like Mario Kart or Super Mario Brothers or, or whatever you like. Um, is there any questions about how emulation works? Yeah, so the instructions that are loaded from the ROM, from the cartridge, yeah. are interacting with code that is inside of the Nintendo itself or is this the entire instruction set? Like everything that is required to load up and play that game is on that four kilobytes? There's like some operating system. I don't think that Nintendo has an operating system. It's okay. it's like it's really all there on the cartridge. Like if okay. you don't put it in the cartridge, it's like the components of the actual Nintendo, unlike today's like machines, are just like the processor, which is um, it's like a Ricoh 6502 processor. Um, it contains like the ability to to load and run instructions. I think that that's sort of germane because I appreciate you asking that because everything you need to know to understand how the game works is in the game itself. There's no firmware whatsoever. So for example, if you wanted to emulate how the PlayStation works, you actually have to get a binary image that represents its operating system. And then you have to load that thing. No such thing for the Nintendo. It's all there on the cartridge. <sighs> Getting it all fit onto the cartridge is actually like a task. Um, some of the smaller games are really small, down to eight kilobytes. 
I think Galaxian is eight kilobytes. The largest Nintendo game gets up to one megabyte. That was towards the end of its run. Um, the one megabyte one, I forget what its name was. It was something goofy. Nobody played it. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, the address space wasn't able to access all of his memory at once. So the cartridges actually came with a really cool like memory mapping module. It's called an MMC. There's a little note about it in my blog. But they're usually called mappers in the context of emulators. What they do is they determine like, when you ask for a certain amount of memory or when you ask for a certain portion of memory, that's certain like, part of the address space, how to load that. So if you are able to correctly manipulate the mapper, you get the entire game through. But if not, you just get like the bottom like however much is addressable. I think it's like 128. I don't know. Anywho, so any other questions about emulation? There's no way to get from the code on top to the code on the bottom, right? I, the code on bottom is a screenshot from this uh, really cool thing that I found on the internet, which is a detailed disassembly of the game. It looks like it was done by hand. So to get the code on the bottom, it has to be done by hand. In the case of Super Mario Brothers, it actually was done by hand. I'll show you um, what this, this assembly looks like. It begins up here. I got this off of, I think this was a gist when I found it on um, GitHub. So what they've done is actually go through and um, created an assembly file that you can actually build the entire game from if you have the little, the correct program, this thing right here. Um, they've done some really, really awesome work. I don't know who did this. Um, if anybody does, let me know. <laughs> some. Someone who is a true nerd, much <laughs> nerdier than me. This, uh, this disassembly, I did not have access to it when I first discovered all this crap. But um, it was immensely helpful later when I wanted to go back and actually discover how this worked. So what they've done is uh, they've loaded all the memory into like, values so that it can be bundled up in the ROM. And then they've taken the instructions and just written it out and sort of commented every single thing. And we can actually see it's like it's literally doing everything. Initializing the memory, loading the video. It's, it's as primitive as can be. <laughs> um, so that's what this assembly looks like. Um, I can show you the binary data. It looks like this. This is the address in memory. These bytes actually represent the content of the, uh, the ROM dump. And this is just an ASCII display of those contents. Most of that won't be anything we can read, um, to be quite honest, uh, except for the, the top portion. It turns out all these ROM dumps put a series of magic numbers that identify it as such at the top. So anybody who doesn't know what the file is, they can at least determine what it is later. But the rest of this is sort of Greek. But we're going to come back to this in a moment. Um, at this time, I'd actually like to show you the actual Super Mario Brothers game. I know you have all seen it. I know you will know what it looks like. But I want to show you what warp zone I'm talking about. It's on the second level. And um, I'm going to ask Shauna to play through. So you know exactly where we are and what we're going to modify. Shauna is about to load an unmodified version of Super Mario Brothers using an emulator called Mednafin. Have any of you heard of this emulator? What is it? Oh. It's, um, it's a command line emulator. If you have OS X, you can actually install it through Homebrew. It's, uh, it's a tap in the game's tap. If you have, um, I think it's available through most like the Debian repositories and so on. But in either case, I chose it for this demonstration because it's open source. It's pretty well documented. 
it's really good emulation and it's very low latency, so it's actually like playing the game. I have found in a lot of situations where I'm emulating a game that it's so sluggish that it's hard to like properly do the platform jumps and so on. But Medifin makes that so much better. So you're gonna Yeah, definitely don't judge Sean as playing. But again, if you know where the one up is in the first world, you're probably done this time. <laughs> <laughs> Was that one news to anyone? <laughs> it doesn't matter how she gets there, it just matters that she gets there. <laughs> I think they've played this before. <laughs> <laughs> here, here, we need this though. I have a question while she's playing. Sure. The, how do you get the ROM off of the cartridge itself? You have to have hardware to do it. What is it called? Do you have to look it up? I think it's a ROM dumper, okay. but I don't recall offhand if that is the proper name. Do you, okay. Have you heard of one? I, I don't know of one, and I wanted to try it sometimes, but I don't want to have. I don't know if it's an authorized Nintendo licensed product. <laughs> it may be a question of harvesting the zip out of um, an actual Nintendo and then soldering stuff to it. Yeah. So Sean is cheating. <laughs> So she's, uh, she's accessing the warp zone here. This is uh, the little hidden warp zone that's behind level <coughs> one, two. Um, have all of y'all seen this before? Mm -hmm. I, I figured. I saw it in the wizard. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was three, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Okay. Um, you're thinking of the whistle. Anyway, she's going to go into four. This is an unmodified warp zone. You go down the pipe. You go to level four. Totally cool. Now you're in level four. You've warped ahead. Um, it doesn't matter if she's. <laughs> it doesn't matter if she survives or not. This is. Uh, I just wanted to show you guys which warp zone I was talking about. That's 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 as good a place as any to stop, right? Cool. Um, so I want to talk about some of the glitches that have been found in like Mario World. Um, you guys may have heard of the most famous glitch. It's called the Minus World. Has anyone not heard of it? Oh, excellent. <laughs> so I've never been able to do it. Um, and so I cannot show you me actually doing it here today. That's actually um, my <coughs> cheating way of getting to the Minus World is actually what brings us here. But just to briefly cover like what the Minus World glitch is about, someone discovered back in the 80s that if you go close to where the warp zone is for that, um, the, end of the, um, the end of the level, the second level, you can do a weird maneuver where you jump off of the pipe, hit the bricks in a way that triggers a bug in the collision detection. It sucks you back through the brick wall, and then you end up seeing the pipe for the warp zone. It doesn't trigger the warp zone. It just shows you one of the pipes running. You go down the pipe. And then it loads this really fun screen. Uh, I'll show you here. Yeah, that was a bad move. It looks like this when you load it. Um, this is why it's called the Minus World. It's not really the Minus World. It happens to be Blank World here, dash one. I have, I've heard a number of theories about how this works and why this happens. But thanks to this really sweet disassembly, I was able to actually find out how it works. I printed off some of the bytes here. Uh, you guys can't see this. <laughs> no, I have a better idea. It's in my notes. <coughs> oh, this is my outline. Notes. This thing. I read through the disassembly until I found this, this stuff. 
um, the important thing are actually right here, the warp zone numbers. So um, four, three, and two. I found this when I was looking one day on how to change Mario's name. There's um, a little cool guide here that I have on how to change, or, or how the, uh, the numbers here correspond to the letters in the Nintendo game. This is not ASCII. What it actually is is that 0 through 9 represent the numbers, and everything above that represents letters. So to spell Mario, you actually need these numbers. In hexadecimal, the numbers look like this. So one day a long time ago, I was going through the game, changing the names to like, you know, my name, <laughs> like you do. And I realized how the letters work. And I thought, well, I could find all the, the so-called strings in the game. I could like see what they all represent and how they work. But even more importantly, I realized that I could see the numbers in the game because these are represented per se. I can actually find the raw numbers in the game, numbers to represent anything. How many lives you start with, where warp zones go, that sort of thing. So I didn't have the disassembly at the time. I used a hex editor back then. And I'm going to show you what I actually did now. Hex fiend. Open file. I'm just going to open this unmodified file here. So. Again, just to, just, just to reiterate, this is as much Greek to me as it is to you. But I did something very simple. 04, 03, 02. I just searched for the bytes and found them right here. This, uh, this particular set of bytes only happens, I think, twice in the file. Yeah, there's a second one. Oh, there's a third one. Um, some of these I can rule out, though. Um, one of the times that I saw it was actually like in a sequence of all the numbers. I can kind of rule that out because that doesn't correspond to anything. That's like all the numbers have to be there in the ROM somewhere because there's literally nothing in the Nintendo that knows about numbers. Um, there was another one that I saw, and it was sort of a red herring. Um, there was nothing for me to indicate that it was a red herring. It was just like I figured it out through trial and error. But this is the actual, this is the gravy right here. Um, to test out that it worked, what I did is I went in and I changed this one to be an 8 and saved it. And I figured when I first did this, like, this won't do anything. This will just change the label above the pipe. Like, this is, uh, this won't work. But lo and behold, I played it and Shauna will show you what I found. You locked your computer. So it predictably changes the label. But what is more, when you go down the pipe, it actually leads you to world eight. Now, <clears throat> when I first did this, I did not understand at the time why it worked the way it did. Like it. <laughs> <laughs> You're not ready for eight, Sean. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever played eight. <laughs> Who actually plays eight? It's <laughs> Yeah. I am. Um, I thought this was fascinating. How could it be that changing that one number can take you to where you want to go in the game? Like, and I thought that was pretty cool. Like, I could beat the game really easily and just go to any world that I want. Um, turns out, in the disassembly, it actually takes the label from above the pipe and loads it to find out what world to go to. It, that number does double duty. Um, there's actually a, a routine in um, the, the disassembly, when I look through, that actually goes through and looks for the label above the pipe to figure out which world to go to. So all I have to do is change the label, and I always go to the world I want. So I'll, I'll leave it over there. Um, if you remember the, uh, that set of numbers that I had that corresponded to all the letters, so all the way until you get to like 35 represents the numbers of the alphabet. And then 36 represents um, a space. So I thought, well, let's put it in a space and see what happens. Um, turns out this is the minus world. So I'm going to let Shauna show you what happens when you do this. Have you tried to put in any letter? Like, is there any that's the B world? 
I'm getting there. <laughs> this is the minus world. It looks a lot like world seven. <laughs> and this is identical to the world that you guys did actually hack the use of brick hacks to build. Yeah. There's, uh, there's videos of people like playing it online. This is uh, one of the reasons I chose Medifin, um, because its emulation is pretty accurate. It's not, oh, my bad. It's not perfect. And in fact, some of the, the things that we're going to do later that are kind of against God. Wow. What happened? Oh, it sent you halfway through the level because you'd already gotten halfway through. <laughs> Definitely. I imagine what's going on is that like it doesn't know that it's a water level and it's at the halfway point. But when they design the water levels, they of course have to avoid doing that, but you know, not in this because this doesn't really exist. <laughs> wow, Shauna. Game over. I think you've read my blog post. <laughs> that is exactly what I discovered. Um, like, it seemed to me that like, I could put in any value. So I didn't know what the game would do when you put in number nine. Um, but I'm going to step back just a second and kind of cover what actually happens when you trigger the real minus world glitch. So it's not like this where it loads a warp zone that's corrupt. What's actually happening is that it's showing the pipe that corresponds to a warp zone. It knows that it has to trigger the routine that warps you to another world. But because of your goofy collision detection, you manage to get to the pipe before you trigger a routine called the scroll lock object. So what happens when you reach the world normally, it stops scrolling. And at that moment, it triggers the labels to like, pop into place. Now, in uh, the minus world glitch that uh, most people know from the internet, and I think there's like videos. I, I didn't have time to look before my talk. Um, in the ordinary course of events, you would um, trigger the pipe to appear, but not trigger the labels to appear. The game would go and look above the pipe when you go down it, knowing that you're in a warp zone, knowing you have to go somewhere, but not having the labels. And it does the only thing that it can do and sends you to the minus world because there's a blank space. Um, is this all clear so far? Does anybody have any questions? Cool. Um, I figured out, like, I, this is actually a thing that I was mistaken about when I wrote the original blog post. Um, I was misled by the disassembly. because There's actually a comment in the disassembly that blames one of the warp zones uh, later on in the game on the glitch. Like, it, it figures that it's loading the wrong warp zone, which sounds sensible because the other warp zone has spaces in its labels because there's only one pipe there. However, that's not the case. It's just, um, does this other scroll lock bug, basically, that you're triggering. So I'm getting through this talk a lot faster than I thought I would. Um, I'm sorry? That was exactly my plan. I requested a long form session, but I wasn't sure I was going to need it. Um, it depended on how many questions there were. And I didn't have as many slides as I thought I was going to have. But now that you've taken the journey, yes, yeah, so we can definitely go in and like put in uh, a number nine, for example. So I'll have Shauna show you what horrible thing happens when you put in the number nine for the world. What's the normal, like when you normally play the game, what's the highest world you get to before you win? Eight. Eight. Oh, it is. Okay. So eight is the end of the game. Nine, by all rights, should not exist. <laughs> 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 oh, man. 
So one of the things you have to know about these like abortions of worlds is that they happen to have glitches. Like sometimes the um, the the processor doesn't actually know what to do with the situation that it's in. There's like bad state in memory. So when that happens, um, it's kind of up to the implementation to figure out what to do. And this particular one just resets the game. Um, I've seen other ones freeze the game. And I have an inkling that the hardware would actually freeze the game. But I've never managed to like glitch out an actual ROM or uh, cartridge. So I have no way of knowing what it would actually do. You could presumably modify a ROM and then reload it onto a cartridge, right? Yes, you could. To my knowledge, no one has done this. Um, <laughs> you can use a, there's a tool called the Power Pack, which they use for development and stuff. So you can put ROMs on it and then play on the actual hardware. So. I would love to do that sometime. And if well, like one of you uh, undertakes to do that, like I think that would be super cool to see. Like make a video and. I <laughs> Another question. Sure. Um, if, if World Night exists at all, I really do believe that these levels are to some extent procedurally generated. There are, as far as I know, 255 possibilities. Okay. Uh, all of the ones that you get to that are not nine are similar, right? That they glitch out like that? Or... Exactly. Um, they, they do seem to be procedurally generated. This is, this is a, a bit of, um, this is why I say hacking instead of disassembling. I don't truly know what it's doing. Yeah. Um, I, haven't, I haven't gone that far. I'm not a, like a, an assembly. Like, <laughs> I'm not an expert in assembly in 6502. Um, I've gotten like pretty good mileage out of the assembly I found on the internet. Like figuring out how this whole bug even works in the first place yeah. was was like a pretty cool, cool accomplishment. Especially since everything on the internet either doesn't know or seems to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them, yes. Um, and I actually got through level two on one of them before it glitched. This is why I played through again. Oh, darn it. So I guess figuring where the character is on the screen and like what's going on that causes the level to end. It's not like nine is bad and ten is bad, but eleven works and you can play it at the end. There are ways for even level eleven to fall apart. You end up in the right position with the other game. Yes. Yeah. Every, every unhappy level is unhappy in its own way. <laughs> um, it's sort of bizarre that way. The way, so like, World 9 is sort of unsatisfying in this way and that it tends to glitch rather easily. But I think that's because as a swimmer, you get free reign of the entire map. And you're not normally supposed to be up there. Like, it's kind of like in the Matrix where Neo can fly. <laughs> like, like, he has no business being up there. So same thing with Mario. Um, so that was World 9. What else do we have? From this point, I just want to show you like different examples of worlds that I found. This should have been a short form session, I think. This, and this one, you actually can get stuck in if you don't go the right way. It actually will box you in. <laughs> this may look familiar to some of you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Independently, and that's how they're getting crossed. But it's this, is this still basically one set of bubble geometry, or, or not? Yeah. Oh, well. oh. I went either way, which I did both times. <laughs> you, <laughs> and, and you, you can't actually break out. These are not all unbreakable. Yeah. 
I am tempted to oh. agree with your conclusion. <laughs> like, you won! Woohoo! Oh, your princess is in another castle. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty great, yeah. Some of these worlds are truly bizarre. Do um, you have another one? Um, that is uh, that is tricky. I am not absolutely sure what all you can change. Um, Have you tried to change like number of lives that you've done this or anything? That world's terrible. So this one's actually kind of funny. If it will, uh, I guess I'm out of time. Yeah, the time, the time is. And it's not really setting. Zero. That's yeah. interesting. Um, this time you're gonna do it. Like, oh. <laughs> What happens I think is, I timed myself out for the last time I was playing it. And I, so, somehow it left it in a bad state. Mm, so uh, the, the actual emulation has to be restarted. Yeah, I'm well, gonna, accessing well, memory. Is it an F12? That's what I'm doing. Okay, cool. So hopefully that will. I'll have to play through, but. We got some time to burn. Yeah. <laughs> this is why I requested a long form session. I thought initially we'd have to play through over and over. Yeah. Can you I edit the map? That you, you can, um, you can do all of these things if you are clever enough to figure out how the little code works. One of the things I discovered as I was um, putting in different numbers is that the numbers would render themselves as like different little background things. Like so, you can go to World Brick or um, World like Coin or things like that if you just like put in different numbers. So I suspect that if you are clever enough to look through memory for where the data for each world is defined, and I'm sure it'll just be like a grid, then you can play through um, each world and change it as you wish. I never got that ambitious. I thought that the procedurally generated worlds were so much more fascinating personally. Yeah. Well, see, what, what I would do is make the first level just have a whole bunch of just like all the work types. <laughs> I don't know if she knows the collision detection bug oh, thing. Yeah. Oh. Go forward until you can't walk and then bust some bricks. Well, yeah, I mean, I know I can, like, finish the level. I'm aware of that. <laughs> I definitely do. <laughs> there's no exception handling. There's no like thing checking to make sure there's an error. It simply makes the best of what it can do. And I suspect that these procedurally generated levels have a lot to do with overflow. Who's the best one? <laughs> this one's. The neon colored one's pretty cool. <laughs> 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 I did actually, that's why it was timing out before when I did the video, I actually ran the time down to see if anything would 
I guess so. Um, like I said, I just hacked it. I didn't go and do like a real disassembly. So I, um, I'm not certain what the possibilities are. I know that you cannot fill a level with warp pipes easily because you have to find out like the code that triggers when you do the warp pipe and like do that whole thing. You have to actually modify the game pretty dramatically to, to get that, I think. So. so in the disassembly that you showed, um, I mean, do we know what the game, what language the games were originally written in that then compiled to the binary? Uh, the games are written in assembly. Oh, they were? Okay. Yeah, so the games would have been like, like, there's no way you can get the kind of like efficiency and low level like performance to, unless you write the machine code itself. Um, I've seen some artwork about planning out the games, and what they're doing is like taking a, like a piece of grid paper and drawing out the levels and like figuring out which numbers correspond and putting those into the ROM. Wow. It's sort of wild. Well, except they couldn't which take the harder way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, on, on the plus side, though, that means that the disassembly is relatively safe because it's not done by a big bad compiler. I think that's I, I think that's fair to say. Um, I found, so I don't know 6502 assembly language. Um, I found that this assembly, nevertheless, like sort of easy to read. Um, a lot of it had to do with um, how easy it was to. Um, oh. You did win, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> you won in our I heart. wanted your heart, Jonas. <laughs> Sorry, I lost my train of thought. What was I saying? Did you have a question? How easy the assembly is to read. Oh. You because you're superhuman. No. <laughs> it's just really well commented. I see. Okay. Yeah, I was actually just taking through the disassembly. Uh, the way it looks like it loads the level is it, there's a start address to the level, and each level has a known stride, and it just sets the, it, uh, the, the level number plus uh, the stride times the level number. So the start address plus the level number times the stride. So you're going past the level number. I don't know. That that seems a little too simple because what it's it's, it's actually like I found it in this <laughs> Like there's something else going on though, because the levels are like modifications of existing levels. So the pointer to whatever level must be overflowing, right? No, they're, they're structured, right? They don't just look like random like if you look at a random bitmap, it's not gonna be ordered as those levels. Right. It's probably you're probably right that it does uh, overflow or something. But according to the actually I guess I'm trusting the comments in the One of those comments told you that the warp zone was actually yeah. correct, right? The, sometimes the comments can be wrong. They are pretty good comments and like apparently easy to find online. Um, but like any comments. <laughs> 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 like any comment. Read the comments. Read the text. <laughs> so in relation to this, I mean, kind of playing these games much younger than I am now, there were tools and tricks called Game Genies and other uh, devices where you would input what seemed to be a somewhat random string of letters or that it would cause, you know, Mario can jump infinitely. Obviously, someone with these devices has figured out that certain registers can be modified to end up being still playable, but without, you know, <laughs> without having, you know, access to say, a well-documented docu disassembly, how did these guys who created these sorts of cheap and assist devices actually, you know, I'm still trying to figure out how they managed to make the transaction work or, and figure out something that actually, actually worked. Especially since those were mostly third-party products, they might not even have had access to the original code. They wouldn't have had access to the code, but yet, you, you know, they, you input this seemingly random string of letters into the game genie and, oh look, I have an inventory full of things that let me fly through levels. Yeah, as somebody might or might not have done these things once. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you do partial disassemblies and look to see what's going on, and eventually you figure it out. I mean, you, you know, the one of the nice things about these like the chips is that you almost don't have to have a disassembly; you can almost treat the bias to hex once you get good enough. And uh, and uh, so, yeah, absolutely, you, you poke at it, and then you try things because it's free to try. 
write things, and uh, if they work, then you write them down, and if they don't, then you try to figure out what else. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's true that I've done something like that here. Um, you're right that the game shark is sort of finicky. I think they actually obfuscated the numbers that you put in to make it less obvious what it was doing. But there was a couple of strategies for actually hacking those games, depending on who's actually coming up with the hack. Um, one thing is that you could actually like find a value whose number is known, um, locate all the locations where that value occurs, trigger something that changes that value, and then narrow down the list to the ones that actually did the similar change. Then you know where like a certain value is stored, say the time or your health or something like that. Then you can go through and um, put in whatever you want. Um, but as you said, because same people structure, um, you might look around that value yeah. for other interesting bits that would be related. And yeah, absolutely. So with the time yeah. code, you might also find the code for the health meter or absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, but uh, remember the game shark is pretty primitive. Like I don't, I don't remember what capabilities the old school like game genie or game shark had. It was the genie was basically you put in three strings, up to three strings of letters that seemed fairly random, so that you could affect three things about the game, whether that was infinite jump ability, infinite lives, and power ups that don't go away, those kinds of things. And so it seemed like what it was doing. Was Yes. Yeah, I, I think that all of this is possible because Super Mario was like really thrifty. And I'm not sure um, many of these cool <coughs> procedurally generated worlds would be possible on other systems. But I don't know. I think it's pretty cool. Um, 
Uh, evidently, uh, did you have a question? Yeah, I was just going to say, like, do you know anything about like, where or how the music, the code, the sound effects, the music was stored? Because I noticed a lot of these packs don't seem to affect the music. Like, I know there are five separate oscillators in the Ambient chip, and uh, the 6502 chip, I think, is a sound chip as well. So do you think more of these packs would like, affect the music, but a lot of them don't really seem to? So I was wondering if you know anything about how that's stored on the chip or I had had the impression that the SVU was a separate piece of hardware, but I could be wrong. But that stuff is in there. Um, there's, um, there's like programs that actually can take a ROM and dump them out. But I've never, um, I've never personally hacked them. I know that they are very hackable because there's an entire genre of music based around it. Yeah, I, I, I make music, but I use Fama Tracker, which is like this editor that somebody wrote. Like you don't actually, you're not, it's not assembly code, you enter codes. Like yeah. Now, I think um, there are people who have gone so far as to modify the music and use a Nintendo to play it. Like, it's, it's pretty wild. So. Um, I have not. I, I am not that nerdy. But um, Did I answer your question? Uh, yeah, that works. Okay. I, don't, I, I guess like, the bottom line is I don't know um, what it takes to modify it, but I know that it can be done. Anybody else have any questions that I missed? Have you tried this with other I personally have not. Um, I, uh, I enjoyed the simplicity of the Super Mario. It's actually like bizarrely well documented compared to a lot of other games. Um, I've been wanting to try it on Legend of Zelda because there's so many more secrets in, in that game. Um, so many more opportunities to do weird things. And it's, sem it's of a similar age and a similar size that I think that would be like possible to do, but I haven't done it. Um, I'd like to sometime. The, the genesis of this whole thing was like, um, I was talking to Jonan one day, and I mentioned that I'd done this, and he was like, oh, that's cool. You should write up a thing, and I did. So um, I, I guess this is like not like a, a regular hobby of mine. It's just a thing that I happen to do. So. It's awesome. Thank you for doing it. Thank you. <laughs>